Imagine every time you wanted something, you just built a factory and poof, you had an endless supply of that item. Nice, right? But not very efficient. And unless you were a ultra disciplined minimalist, you'd have quite a bit of factories on your hand. And over time, if you kept desiring more things, their toxic emissions would make it rather difficult to safely inhabit this beautiful floating rock. I mean, all I gotta say is, good thing this isn't the case in real life. Unless, of course, we're considering what happens inside us. Yo, 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 what is up? Welcome back to another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and longevity and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic way. Today, we are diving into what may be one of the coolest and most critical parts of our existence, our mitochondria. Exploring how these in-house cellular factories may be the secret, or at the very least a critical factor, for both short-term health and long-term longevity. And just like in our real world, if we don't keep these factories up to code, they'll spew harmful toxins into the environment. In this case, our cellular environment, making it hard and possibly even impossible to thrive, which makes their dysfunction officially not good for biological business, and quite possibly at the foundation of our modern day health woes. You know, those chronically tired, lethargic, low energy, achy, sore, depressed, and anxious woes. Those woes that we just attribute to getting old even though that has probably a lot less to do with it than we really think. Yeah, those ones. So first we'll do a quick refresher on the secret cellular celebrity life of these mission critical organelles, then talk about a major factor bringing down their vibe and thus our vibe, and finally run through how we can fix these mighty full beasts and get them operating efficiently once again. Because I know you know you knew I knew that these cellular factories are both renewable and repairable, which I guess, makes us humans officially green. At least, until we start building those real factories and driving to them and stuff. Moving on, let's talk about why these metabolic bad boys and girls are so important. Our cellular factories. Mitochondria are organelles within every cell that generate most of the energy needed to power these cells' biochemical reactions. And since we, you and me, are made up of cells, essentially, these little guys power our life. And they do this by producing chemical energy called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, which is the energy currency we trade to sustain biological function. Now that's all fine and dandy, and the thing that they're best well known for, rightfully so. But beyond common knowledge, their job description actually goes much, much deeper. They also play a central role in various biological processes, such as the citric acid cycle, fatty acid, oxidation, what you know about ketones, the biosynthesis of metabolites, signal transduction of calcium ions, regulation of programmed cell death, aka apoptosis, and have an overall key role in both development and aging. So, it's kind of in our best interest to keep these unsung metabolic heroes happy, don't you think? I mean, who in their right mind would do the opposite, huh? What was that? M mitochondria dysfunction is at the root of many of the top diseases plaguing modern society. Diseases that are increasing in prevalence with each passing year. Okay, maybe it's worth a deeper dive into what exactly is going on or dysfunction problem. Mitochondria dysfunction has earned the recognition as one of the top longevity liabilities on the market, being highlighted as an underlying mechanism for not only aging, but chronic inflammation and metabolic disease across the board. But what exactly makes it associated with conditions such as cardiovascular disease, neurodegeneration, and cancer? Well, let's first define what exactly metabolic dysfunction is. At its core, it is the inability of the mitochondria to produce levels of ATP that maintain the energy needs of the cell. Long story short, the mitochondria cannot fully perform their energy factory functions, which is a little bit of a problem in and of itself, but 
the dysfunction story happens to be much deeper than most people realize. This dysfunction can happen across a multitude of different vectors, including mitochondrial DNA damage, electron transport chain impairment, calcium imbalance, mitophagy deficiency, mitochondrial biogenesis impairment, and imbalance of production and clearance of reactive oxygen species, making this condition a multifaceted, complex process in which it is highly likely that there are much more unknowns than knowns. That being said, what we do know is one of the most common drivers of this dysfunction, a condition in which a large percentage of the population face out here in the wild, is excessive energy stress, aka overnutrition. And 99% of the time, it is not overnutrition of the nutrient-dense, fiber-filled, grass-fed, wild, organic, real whole foods. Oh, no, no, no. It's the highly palatable, nutrient-scarce, energy-dense, ultra-processed crapola. The stuff that is nearly impossible to not overindulge on. So let's take a look into how things start going wrong. When our mitochondria are stressed and damaged, it not only dampens the aforementioned ATP production, but also impairs metabolite conversions and ramps up the production of cellular reactive oxygen species. Not an ideal scenario, and here's why. Reactive oxygen species are a natural byproduct of energy metabolism, aka mitochondrial function. They are what I like to call a byproduct of being open for biological business. The thing is, they're unstable, kind of like that one crazy ant we all have. This is due to having an unpaired electron. Now, that doesn't mean that our body isn't prepared for the chaos, as it has developed mechanisms to neutralize these unstable molecules with something called antioxidants. However, when an imbalance occurs and there are more reactive oxygen species than antioxidants to neutralize them, we have a little problem a condition called oxidative stress, or where these unstable reactive oxygen species outnumber the counteracting neutralizing antioxidants. And what happens next is definitely not cool for biological school. These reactive oxygen species scavenge the area in search of an electron to neutralize themselves. And if there's no antioxidant to donate one, they steal one from healthy tissue, damaging it in the process. I know, a-holes right? Driving DNA damage, mutations, impairing mitochondrial energy metabolism, and promoting the progression of metabolic inflammation. And when you play this phenomenon on repeat for days, weeks, and even years, we end up with a cellular and metabolic situation on our hands. These high levels of reactive oxygen species exacerbate inflammation by activating more pro-inflammatory factors, worsening conditions such as obesity and insulin resistance, and creating a very vicious cycle of more cellular damage and more metabolic dysfunction. And the data to date has confirmed this phenomenon's longevity liability status, showing a strong correlation between mitochondrial damage and accelerated aging. Yikes is right. So. What exactly is it about overeating which really throws off our mitochondrial vibes? Overnutrition and under-energized. Here's where things come full circle. Every time we overeat, the body responds with a series of acute adaptive reactions in an effort to preserve an equilibrium. First, we need to process all of this energy so it quickly and abruptly increases the amount of mitochondria to meet the metabolic demand. Adipocytes or fat cells increase their lipid storage capacity. Hormones like insulin become hyper-expressed. Cells become remodeled due to the chronic overload. Reactive oxygen species becomes more abundant. Pro-inflammatory factors become upregulated. Cells become damaged and resistant to the energy storage hormone insulin, which thus reduces energy accumulation in certain cell types and comes full circle by impairing the function of these cells mitochondria even more. And guess what? It's been displayed in terms of organism behaviors that mitochondrial dysfunction is closely associated with anxiety. And anxiety tends to stimulate an organism's cravings for food, especially sweets, which you've guessed it, exacerbate the dysfunction even more. Now, 
there are certainly many, many, many more things going on here. But this hopefully provides the idea of what a constant influx of energy over the metabolic need of the body can and does do. And we actually did a full breakdown here on how the overnutrition of glucose and fructose actually impair mitochondrial function, especially in conditions of stress. And although mitochondrial dysfunction and metabolic inflammation are distinct processes, they certainly both influence and play into the not so sweet symphony, which is metabolic disease. A show that no one should willingly buy tickets to and see. So with that, how can we get these powerhouse organelles up and operating efficiently once again? The good news is we can nurture our mitochondria back to health and even stimulate the creation of new healthy ones. Let's see how. Boosting mitochondria function. Like I mentioned, there is good news. When it comes down to improving the health and function of our internal energy factories, so much is possible through lifestyle alone, ranging higher and wider than simply what we eat. What the hell did you just say? However, it's a pretty good place to start, especially since, you know, kind of what we just discussed. So let's hit on some of the obvious and non-obvious ways to boost mitochondrial function, and by association, your function. First, your fuel. Surprise, surprise. And no, a highly restrictive diet is not the best path forward. Hopefully that doesn't upset you. That being said, most do overeat and overeat those ultra processed food riddled with refined carbohydrates. Now, does this mean sugar is evil? No. However, excess sugar in the form of highly processed, highly refined, nutrient scarce, fiber lacking foods and drinks probably is problematic. And before any dysfunction is evident as a symptom, a constant daily sugar siege may very well be impairing your chemical factories. Thus, like we've mentioned a few times now, impairing you and setting the stage for the manifestation of chronic disease. So making an effort to consume high quality, real, whole, organic, grass-fed, wild foods may be one of the best things you can do for your cellular factories. These real foods will be absorbed slower, leveling out the metabolic demand, keep you fuller longer, while also providing a great source of exogenous antioxidants to aid the anti-inflammatory fight. Sounds like a pretty good deal to me, no? And if you need some extra help navigating the modern day food landscape, we have a full guide which will be linked in the description below. Next, staying on the topic of food, we have structured meal timing or partitioning your 24 hour day into feeding and fasting windows ranging from four to 12 hours of feeding. This practice, also called time-restricted feeding, has shown some high promise in improving mitochondria health, insulin sensitivity, metabolic flexibility, reducing inflammation, and much, much more. One super cool mitochondria-specific process which is stimulated during fasting is mitophagy, or the recycling of old, weak, damaged, leaky mitochondria and the replacement with new ones. And I don't know about you, but after all we discussed, sounds pretty useful to me. Time-restricted feeding can also help with the overeating by aligning one's hunger cues into that specific window. Although, this will take a little while and need consistency. You can explore the 60 plus videos on the Growing Fasting 101 playlist for more talks on that. Next, we have the oh-so-mighty moving of the badonka donk. This may be one of the single best stimulators of mitochondrial biogenesis and mitophagy that we have, AKA the cleanup and creation of new healthy mitochondria. As mitochondrial biogenesis is a direct byproduct of exercise. And ironically, one of the best ways to prevent inflammation is by performing acute activities that cause it. As a byproduct of moving Zebadonka Donk is the secretion of a number of bioactive compounds which reduce inflammation, dilate blood vessels, and relieve stress. And get this, research has shown that exercise actually helps increase and maintain antioxidant levels, confirming once again that movement is in fact medicine. A good goal to aim for is working up to the range of 65 to 85% max heart rate for 20 to 30 minutes a few times a week. Now, 
I would have to put myself in longevity jail if I did not call out one of the best ways to promote cellular function and control both inflammation and stress. High quality, circadian aligned sleep. Here's why. Deprived sleep has been shown to impair our mitochondria's capacity, decrease its function, and increase the genes involved in the response of oxidative stress and apoptosis. Yikes. And interestingly, this chronic lack of sleep has been shown to cause hormone imbalances, which modulate our cravings and our propensity to eat, as we talk about here. Double yikes. So let's not forget that sleep is the time where our organs rest regenerate and ramp up detoxification pathways, modulating the immune system and reducing inflammation in the process. Thus, why we have the entire How to Sleep playlist dedicated to it. It's the foundational component of all things health and longevity for a reason, so let's not mess around with it. And instead, prioritize it. Deal? Deal. Finally, some other key interventions in the toolbox include heat and cold stress, think sauna, warm or ice bath and shower, or just spending some time in cold temperatures. These activities stimulate our respective heat and cold shock response, which act as good stressors for our mitochondria health and function. Topics we have full videos on, which I'll link below. Another tool to potentially use is photobiomodulation, say that three times fast, or the use of light therapy such as red light, as there has been some interesting data displaying how a few minutes of this light therapy a day can boost the function and prevalence of our energy factories. Again, a topic we cover in other videos, which will be linked below. Next, on the inflammation front, we have grounding and earthing, which is the practice of reconnecting electrically with the earth. This has been shown to neutralize those reactive oxygen species and improve blood flow. And all you need to do is touch some earth. 30 minutes a day is a great goal to strive for. Lastly, we have stress management in the form of breath work, meditation, and mindfulness. All of these have been shown to drastically reduce sympathetic nervous system activation, stress, and inflammation. So get your namaste on. Listen, the goal, as always, is to find your right balance. Knowing that everyone's ideal equilibrium is different, varying based on all their distinct and unique lifestyle factors. These are just some tools at your disposal. Tools that will have far further reach than just improving mitochondrial function. Although, it's important to remember that every single cell in our body relies on these cellular power plants to survive. Which means when we focus on habits which promote their health and efficiency rather than just their pure, unsustainable abundance, we think better, feel better, move better, and function better in the short term and the long. I mean, the last thing we want is an out of control overabundance of poorly operating factories leaking admissions into an ultra sensitive ecosystem with the potential for dire consequences right? Didn't think so. So go own it. <laughs>